Uh, hey everyone, uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Global Health Ethics Panel uh, done by Remedy, um, International Medicine Interest Group, and uh, the Global Health Initiative. Um, we appreciate you coming up. Um, and we have a lot of distinguished panelists. Um, and so, first, we'll just let them introduce themselves. I'm a professor in medicine, and I do cancer research um, both in the U.S. and Nigeria. <coughs> I'm Benjamin Gidron, and I'm a visiting professor at the School of Social Administration here at the University of Chicago. I'm here because of Emily. And she spotted that I teach a course on international perspective on third sector organizations, which are non-profit organizations. And she thought that I might uh, fit into this panel, so I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Rachel Stork. I'm a second year medical student here. And um, I teach a
as an intern on the surgical services in Nigeria after I went to medical school. Being left to suture and to take care of surgical patients, even though I was already qualified as a doctor, left me with a very sour taste in my mouth of my incompetence to handle things, even though that was my responsibility, right? So I think part of the professionalism that we expect in medicine is for people to actually know their limit. And so I had a situation where as an intern, I wanted to suction a patient, right? It's the simplest of things to do. But I actually didn't know how to suction a patient. The nurses knew how to do that. But, you know, as a doctor, I'm like, I'm just going to suction this patient. And what I did was I caused a cardiac arrest, right? And that's a life. And that's somebody's work. That's, I mean, it was just a stupid mistake from my lack of respect for human dignity and my lack of humility for what I know and what I don't know. And so my feeling is that it doesn't matter. No care is better than suboptimal care, right? Because we've seen, even in this country, and this is part of what's going on in the quality movement, where you know doctors who are the least proficient in the work of taking care of patients are the ones that are thrown out there in the first day as interns to take care of patients. And while doctors have always felt that, yes, you know, I can help, if you really know the bad things that can happen when you don't know what you're doing, you will, with trepidation, approach every patient you see because life is so fragile. So my thinking is that, yes, um, you might think that you're going to help, but you have no clue what you're doing. And I think that professionally, you should just say, oh, well, you know, I can do that, even when they're asking you to do that. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect is I have increasingly been um, actually aware of when there are now a lot of students that are going internationally, and even the few doctors that are there who want to take care of patients, they feel that they have to teach you. They feel that they have to to cater to the foreign student and the international student. So now, all these places in Africa are littered with students, and they're hindering the work of the people who are in the clinic. So I think that we have to think about what we're doing uh, so that we can be of help and not really cause more harm to the patients that we're seeing at international sites. So that's where my, why my perspective is that, you know, these are human beings, and if you respect human dignity, you were not supposed to be a doctor when you're not a doctor, and you don't know what you're being asked to do. I don't know if somebody else yeah. wants yeah. to Anybody else want to on the panel respond to that? Yeah, I, I would like to take this issue to a different level. <clears throat> uh, when there was this uh, problem of child labor uh, that the Nike used, in making uh, tennis shoes. Um, of course, uh, such a thing is a breach of standards uh, in the country where Nike is registered, namely the US. Uh, and nobody will think that it's, uh, it, everybody would say it's applicable that uh, children should be used in the manufacturing of shoes. Now, uh, so this relates to the question of no help is better than little help. Because from the perspective of the children in Indonesia, you know, some, some income is better than no income for some of those families. However, of course, the, moral, uh, uh, the, mor the morality of such an issue uh, prevents us to say that uh, we can create one standard for Indonesia and another standard for the US. And uh, this issue that was portrayed here is a little different because it's not a question of general standards, but it's a question of professionalism. Uh, and I agree totally with uh, Dr. Olopati uh, suggesting that um, it not only is an issue vis-a-vis -vis the patients, but it's also, and first of all and foremost, an issue vis-a-vis -vis the professional. Uh, you are not a professional yet, and uh, performing such uh, procedures uh, when you do not have a training, I think, and when in, in the sequence of training, uh, you did not acquire.
acquire enough knowledge and, and understanding of such a procedure, I think it's not only hurting the patients potentially, but also your upbringing as a professional. Uh, Dr. Nazarella, as, as, as a physician that has gone abroad and, and practiced, have you encountered situations like this where, where you were practicing in a situation where maybe it was beyond your level of training? If so, how did you feel about it and how did you approach that situation? Yeah, and I think it's a, a fine line because, as you guys will learn soon enough, uh, I think residency itself is a practice in kind of pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone in certain situations because you're constantly being challenged to learn something new. So I've had situations, you know, the first time I intubated someone here in the States, I wasn't comfortable doing it, but I had the training, I had people backing me up. Um, something that comes to mind I recently in Liberia is um, you see patients that people expect you to have the answer, they expect you to be able to know how to do everything, and um, there are definitely some times when I, you just have to admit, no, I don't know what this is, I don't, I've not done this procedure, and I'm, I'm not going to do it, because of the potential of doing more harm than you can possibly do as far as good. But there are certain times also that you kind of know, you have to t take a step back and say, okay, I know how to do this, I have, maybe haven't done many of these procedures, but I do know how to do this, I've had the training, I can um, approach this problem, I kind of push myself outside that comfort zone. But I think part of it is just understanding the risks of what you're doing, understanding that it's not a procedure, it's a patient, and um, ultimately it's how that affects them that really determines you know, your comfort zone. So for instance, I had, we had a three-month-old that we ended up placing a chest tube on, which is a procedure that I've done many times, but never on a three-month-old. So we did the procedure, it went fine, but it was something that was a little nerve-wracking, um, but at the same time, it was, wasn't something outside my scope of practice. You know, if a surgeon had come and said, can you do an appendectomy, it would have absolutely been no. <laughs> um, because you just have to know, as you said, know your limitations. So, so, so I'm going to push the question a little bit. So, so as, as a practice, practicing physician or a trainee, as a student who has gone abroad, um, and you're put in those situations, um, one of the difficulties, I think, is knowing what your limitations are. Um, because you, Potentially don't know the outcomes of procedures that you may be asked to do. So how, how do you sort of square knowing your limitations without being able to actually know the outcomes of, of what you may be practicing? Right, I mean, I think that's a great question. I guess it comes back again to um, sort of level of training. So as I mentioned, there are certain things that I have read about and know that are part of the scope of emergency medicine practice, which is a large scope. But um, there are certain things that I have never learned, never um, approached, and I just wouldn't feel as comfortable doing those. I, don't, I guess I don't have a really great, hard and fast way that I approach everything, but it was more of a, a gut response. You know, I thought to myself, would, if I were in their position, would I want me doing this on them? <laughs> I don't think that was helpful. I think one general you know, thing that I try to do and, you know, for the Hippocratic Oath, it says first do no harm, right? And so if you know your limitation and you know that the, your, the first rule of principle is first do no harm. You know, so many times on airplanes, I've been, you know, is there a doctor in the house? And I quickly pretend that I've never gone to the hospital. <laughs> right? Because there's no way I'm going to be the emergency doctor on any plane, right? Some people might think it's more important to have a doctor on the plane, but when I've never administered emergency to, to anybody in the last 20 years, I know I can do it, but if there's somebody else who can do it better than I can, then that's what they should do, because I might harm the patient. So I, I would not acknowledge that I can do it. If there's no other doctor, yes, but you know, Luckily, there's always one. What if by chance they just needed a doctor that, that knew breast cancer? Well, <laughs> there's no emergency. <laughs> breast so, so, so that, 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 again, brings up the question is that is, is any care better, better than no care? Um, I mean, it, could there be something considered unethical altruism that you are doing good, you may be in, in balance, that the good that you do offsets some of the bad that you may do and in terms of collateral damage just for the patients that you're taking care of. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think, you know, the philosophical thing actually regarding international, so why 
do you want to go to do international uh, service? What's the motivation? Is it really so that you can practice and learn other things, or that you really want to do good, right? And part of, I mean, what that doctor said, well, there are no rules here. Well, there are rules. And if you've never grown up you know, following rules, then maybe you can show them the best practice that, you know, the reason why we can do this is because we care about the patients, we do this, we do that, and, you know, for, I mean, so you can influence your environment, right, to say we're not going to do that because ethically it's not the right thing to do. So I would think that that would be, and I, that's why we're having this discussion with our students, because you're going to be placed in those circumstances and you also always should have a moral ground on what you will do and what you wouldn't do under those circumstances. And it depends on your value and it depends on your grounding in terms of what it is that you're doing. So what I found to, that I think I hope our students will be doing is demonstrating best practices, right? Learning from international sites and then also spreading the gospel of we're going to be held to the highest ethical standards. And as a result of that, hopefully we elevate their standards instead of you know, declining to their standard of not caring about their people. So, so to push the issue a little bit, we've heard the term standard of care, rules, um, and, and is it, is it would, would you agree or disagree that, that our standards of care should apply regardless of the setting? Or are there circumstances where that our standards of care just can't apply, where they shouldn't apply? American care is too much care. <laughs> <laughs> and so we cannot export that standard of care to anywhere else in the world. In fact, I'm hoping that what our students will learn is how to be good doctors without technology, right? Where you can make clinical decisions, where you can be rational, you can talk to the patient, you can examine them, and then you can become a really good doctor, right? So there's a, always a debate about standard of care and professionalism, right? Because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of business that drives doctors' behavior in America. There's the, you know, uh, the physicians who really practice because they're worried about lawyers, right? In a lot of international settings, people are not worried about that. And in fact, American medicine is coming back to the professionalism of saying, let's make it patient-centered, right? So what I would say is that standard of care is when you, what's best for this patient, right? Not what's best for my practice in terms of how much money we're going to make, what, to, what test can I get, but what's best for this patient? So you will find in a lot of international settings, and now all over, we're talking about competences, right? I delivered more than 150 babies as a medical student in Nigeria, because that's what we learned to do. Because after medical school, you might be the doctor in the rural village, right? When I came to this country, all of a sudden, I couldn't deliver babies. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've done more than my attending, <laughs> you know, gynecologist. So everyone is actually moving away from, you know, um, what's your area of super, super specialist to say, let's train people to competences, right? So if I can deliver a baby, it doesn't matter what the rules are about, who should be delivering babies, you know? Midwives, other people, nurses deliver babies all over the world. But in this country, only obi is deliver babies. No one can afford that, right? So I think, you know, I would rather not say standard of care. I would say what's patient-centered care, who has competences to do it, and if they have competences to do it, then that's what we want to do because that's what's best for the patient. And if that's a guiding principle, then you'll be able to, you know, navigate those tricky situations. <coughs> So I'll push you a little bit on that. So, 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 so what, what if there's a situation then where the competency or what is considered competent in, in one setting is different than what would be considered competent in, in, for a U.S. medical student who goes abroad and it's considered okay for medical students to, say, suture on their own? 
Yeah, but so what? What so think about it? What do you need to learn to be able to suture? Right, you have to learn to be able to really scrub very well because it's the it's the hygiene, right? Uh, you need to be able to tie the knots, right? And you need to be able to make sure that you you know you're putting the suture where it belongs to. Because at the end of the day, even the scar from that suturing depends on how well you put the, the stuff together. I can say this because I did a rotating internship before I came from Nigeria. I did ob surgery, pediatrics, because we were trained to be generalists, right? So I know what it means to learn to tie a suture, right? So if you are then in an OR and somebody says, switch on this person, why would you go and do it when you have no idea on how you clean, how you suture, and now, you know, even the type of, you know, um, uh, 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 suture materials you should use. So I, I think that, you know, if you've done that once or twice, you might actually know how to do it because it's a question of knowing how to tie it. But you've never done that. So it's not the, the length of time you took to learn it that matters. It's, do you understand the principles of you know, hygiene, suturing, and all of that? And then why would you go and learn it the first time on a patient when you're not even qualified to be trained to do it, right? I could be trained to do it as a doctor, but why would a, medi uh, a medical student um, suddenly be suturing, right? So if during a three-month elective in a, in a surgical, uh, uh, on a surgical rotation, you start off and you're there and they train you and you become good at it. Maybe by the end of the third month, you could do it, right? Or you, you yourself will feel competent that you've learned how to do it, right? But if a college kid goes from here, and I've seen college kids who have gone to international studies and they want to switch up, is that appropriate? Well, what do other people think? Um, well, I don't have nearly as much experience as the rest of this panel, um, but I, I think I agree that it's um, definitely about knowing your own limits and remembering that um, the reason you're going on the trip is because you're trying to improve the state of the health in whatever area you're going to. And um, I think it's, it's really you know, important before you go somewhere to really check out what kind of resources you're gonna have there or you know, bring your own resources along, like um, Dr. Callender. Because um, we were fortunate enough that we, on our trip, um, we were always with um, either physicians from Peru or um, Dr. Callender and his wife, or um, and we had uh, extensive training before, so I, by the time we were really spending time with patients, I felt um, like I had been trained um, to a level of comfort, and then I also had um, physicians there with me all the time. So um, I think it's definitely important to to um, evaluate that before you're going to go somewhere, so you don't end up in a situation like this. Um, and even like have the conversation before to know what's expected of you, um, just so that you don't end up in a situation where you really push beyond um, your your limits. So. I would like to relate to your uh, issue of uh, standards. <clears throat> I was uh, asked uh, several times in different universities abroad um, to be either a supervisor or to read uh, research reports by local um, researchers. And I realized that um, not the standards, but the, the way they define research in those countries and you know, the way they conduct research is different from the one that I was used to. But I did not use my standards to, and did not apply my standards in judging their research. I tried to understand their standards and their systems of research and what they value and do not value. After all, research is research. Um, and, and try to evaluate those works or those pieces of research on the basis of the of the standards of those universities and not my own stand, my own systems. So there any? Uh, yeah, we can take questions in between. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is now the time for? Yeah, we're, we're going to. Yeah. yeah, sure. So um, uh, I 
I was involved last year in an Institute of Medicine project on uh, crisis standards of care. And it was occasioned by the, uh, by the flu epidemic, pandemic, um, not by care for people in Haiti or Indonesia or wherever. Um, but it was striking how similar the concerns were. Um, some of this you know, came from Hurricane Katrina and the experience there. Um, and one of the things that this group came out to say was that standards of care, this term, standard of care, is always contextual. And so it, it almost doesn't make sense to say, would you import your standard of care from one context to another? Because the standard of care, by definition, is that you provide the best <laughs> medical care you can given the resources at your disposal. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that as a definitional issue of what, what is a standard of care um, if it is not what many of us sort of have thought of it before, which is, you know, the standard of care is how you treat disease X. <coughs> and so the standard of care for this disease is this treatment. Well, that's no longer the standard of care if this treatment is not available. Right? And, and that's true even legally. If you can't get sued for failing to provide something which you could not physically provide because it wasn't there. So, anyways, I, I just thought that was an interesting uh, definitional question. I wondered. Yeah, I mean, I think the, that's the whole point of um, you know low resource settings and uh, and what it is that you can do. And it's actually one of the challenges that people who go to those places will face. Uh, you know, when we've gone out to um, hospitals in Nigeria, sometimes the doctors are so discouraged because they know what to do, but the resources are not there, or the patients can't afford it, and they have to make judgments every day that, you know, this child who could have antibiotics to, to treat their pneumonia will die because there's no, there are no, you know, no antibiotics. So what standard of care there? You know, it's, you know, you can't give, you know, if you, if you, I mean, and, and this is some of the things that sometimes happen. So, well, they can only afford three days of antibiotics, right? And so, you know, you can use three days of antibiotics, but, you know, they're really not going to get well if you need 15 days of antibiotics. So how do you handle that, right? So in that case, it's three days of antibiotics the standard of care. <laughs> I mean, to, 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 carry, to carry this back, though, home, um, the standard of care for an elderly woman with a fracture is to be admitted to the hospital. Well, we had a patient three days ago who was in the emergency room for three days and was eventually discharged, never having been admitted to the hospital. Does that, is that a crisis standard of care situation? Were we reducing our standard of care? Because, well, it's not, I mean, this, this it is- It might just the hospital, maybe. <laughs> well, but this is, you know, the, these things, you can draw them out to the real extreme, where you say, well, you know, you're gonna withhold antibiotics from someone who's gonna clearly die. But, you know, there are standards, and then there are standards. So I'm, I don't think I'm going to address what's going on in the emergency department at the University of Chicago um, today. But um, I, I will say, and I, I think standard of care, in the way that it's thrown around, it's sort of a legal, it's a legal term to me. Um, and, and it applies very much to the United States settings, and it's, did you or did you not reach the standard of care? Or, you know, like, what, what's expected? When you go, I think you really have to follow your morals and your ethics when you're practicing in low resource settings. So you do the absolute best you can with the resources that you have. And there are very, very difficult ethical dilemmas that come up, and I don't know if this will this will come up or not in, in other case scenarios regarding do you or do you not intubate a patient if you know that the patient's going to die? Well, I mean, yes, you can do it, but is it the right thing to do? So you have to start thinking about things like that. And when, you, when you're talking about Hurricane Katrina, acute, you know, acute disasters where you have a huge influx of patients and not a lot of resources, you have to partition your resources in a way that you can do the most good for the most number of people. Um, and you really, but again, it comes down to it comes down to morals, and it comes down to ethics, and it comes down to sort of what you think is the right thing to do. 
this scenario, I mean, this scenario here where you're asked to, to, you know, with some sort of resource, you're asked to do something that you don't feel comfortable doing. I mean, I, I apologize for missing the beginning comments, but but I mean, I would advise you all to not practice this way. If you don't, if you you know, everyone knows what you're capable of. As a ER attending, I know what I'm capable of and what I'm not. And there are times in the emergency department that I could try something, but that's not the right thing to do for the patient. And I could try them here, or I could try them in another country. You have to follow by what you know, what your skill set is, you know what you're comfortable doing, you know what you've experienced doing, and if you feel comfortable and competent and you really think that it's the right thing to do and you're skilled to do it, then you should you should be able to do it within, within reason. I mean, but if you really don't, you need to stand up for yourself and say this is the right thing for the patient, regardless of where you are. Yeah, so, so that we can go uh, maybe to the next, uh, you said you have four cases, we would hope to get through three. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what would really be nice is I don't want us to miss the opportunity for our students to learn in, at international sites. I think that there will be instances where you actually could learn more by doing, right? And you should really go out there to do. But I think what would be important and why we want to make sure that we have supervision both here and there is that whoever you're going to be working with understands that we expect them to teach you before they put you in such a situation. I hope lots of you will suture and become the best suturist in, in, in your medical school because you, you learned it and then you did it and you learned how to scrub and you learned how to take care of patients in a resource poor setting. So it's not so much that you shouldn't do things there. It's just that, you know, and you know, because this is sort of about remedy. And you you know, I heard that remedy, you know, students just went and did stuff and we thought, well, it would really be nice if they had attendees that went with them, as much as the students didn't think they needed attendees, I'm sure now that they have a faculty that they could ask questions, that could teach them, it becomes a much more meaningful two weeks or three weeks or however many weeks you do. You know that you, you should take advantage of all the time you have and make it a meaningful experience for yourself. So I think learn it and let them teach you, be humble, and once you learn it, then you know competency-wise, what you can do, and then go and do it. Yeah. Can I just say one, one more thing about yeah. resource-limited settings? I just want you guys to understand, so resource-limited settings, practicing medicine, you will be learning a good history and learning learning how to take a good history and do a good physical exam are the two biggest tools you need to practice in resource-limited settings. Because you don't have you don't have a lot of other diagnostics that you have here, and if you can master those skills, which you can you can really work on as a medical student, it will take you so far in being able to actually really truly care for patients. Because you will really be able to you'll be able to figure out what's wrong with just those skills. And so our third year residents, it's a, when they go away right before they graduate to to work in limited research countries, it's a big challenge for them because they're used to having all of these things that they can use, and it really actually tunes their skills as a physician to be able to really do good history and exam. It helps them become better physicians in the long run practicing anywhere with any kind of resource. So you guys, as medical students, learn those skills. And so you're very capable of applying those skills and really doing a lot of good with, with those basic skills in medicine. Just somewhere you won't come up later. Dr. Lopati, you're saying they know it's important for the physicians who are at the, the receiving site to be ready to teach students before they send them out. And then you said earlier that you, know, you noticed that because physicians have feel this obligation to teach international students that they're actually not caring for patients and this, that they just don't have the same amount of time. Um, I just sort of wondered if you could talk about Yeah, that. so this is why, you know, I think, you know, where, you know, one of the things that you'll find is that there are many places where they will say, yes, you come. And a lot of students who are going places where the expectation is not that the, there will be an investment in your learning, right? And the expectation is not is that there will be a formal arrangement where we know that on days one, two, three, or before our students come, we want to make sure that we don't have people who can actually devote the time to train them. And that when the students come, they're going to be of help. Right? So these physicians may be very busy, and it may be that before you get really uh, uh, to take away their time, all you may be able to do is get a good history and physical and be able to help them do that and document that. Right? That could be of tremendous help to them. Right? It could be that they want to do chat review, they want to do other things. So when I, I you know, we send a student to 
uh, South Africa the other day, and the, the sergeant there said, you know, this student is really, really hardworking, or like the useless students who come around expecting us to train them, but they really want to go to the beach, right? So, you know, there are two things. You know, people see that as a time of an opportunity for them to just go party in some, you know, beach resort. And then, oh, by the way, it's so, you know, there's that tourism uh, part of it. Or there's a question about, I'm really here and I really, really want to learn, and I'm going to work just as hard as I do in the U.S. and all of that. So I think it's about <coughs> attitudes that the students take to the international side, and then how the international sites uh, see the student. Shana, you had a question? Or no, I was just going to build on what um, Chrissy was talking about in terms of ethics. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's clinical care or whether you're going there to do research. It's important to understand that there are laws, policies, and um, um, and guidelines within those, uh, even the, the settings that we call, call a resource limited. And those laws, policies, and rules, they thump whatever we think we're taking there from here. Uh, so uh, when you have the ethics board, I mean, you just don't take a protocol here, take it there and start doing it. You know, the way they obtain consent, totally different from what you do here. So you have to respect some of those local laws, rules, and policies. That's what's going to guide what you do there. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble, you be it research or clinical care. Uh, so one of the most important things that you can do uh, in going to um, a setting out of this country is find out what are the rules about this, what are their policies about this. And once you, once you know that, then you can tailor your practice and have uh, a very good time. Otherwise, if you do what's illegal, then you could potentially get into trouble. Yeah, that's actually a very good point because you know many of these countries actually have licensing rules. Right? Doctors are licensed, right? And even because you're a doctor, doesn't mean you should go and practice medicine in a country where you don't have a license, right? Uh, you can teach, but you know to start, you know, taking care of patients. If anything happens, you know, you're liable. In fact, a good example uh, um, to let you know that some of these countries are actually trying to enact laws and rules to protect their, their people. I mean, in Nigeria, you used to be able to just go there and just practice. But, you know, as of uh, December, they've actually changed the rules so that anybody who is a red, I mean, students can go. Students are actually the best. You've you got the best deal. You can go anywhere. And, you know, as long as it's under uh, supervision, you can do anything. Uh, but if you're a resident, uh, for a resident going from here, they actually have to get a temporary license during that period that you're there. So that one, they know you are there, they give you the rules, uh, you know, um, uh, as they're processing your paperwork, uh, so that you're getting into that setting very knowledgeable, knowing that you have a license. And that protects you from being able to practice without uh, much fear. Uh, so, um, so so that's the most, and uh, you know, as faculty, uh, with, uh, at least within GHI, the places that we're sending our students, we're making sure that we know the rules, the regulations, so that uh, for each particular student that approaches us, we can tell them, you know, how to get them <coughs> at a uh, very, very productive time. So we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll move on to the next case then. All right, um, Jane spent two months of her summer volunteering in an HIV uh, TB clinic in South Africa during the summer after her first year of medical school. She spent her time in the clinic running a patient education program. While she was there, she took many photos of patients in the clinic and members of the support groups that were, uh, that run the clinic runs. She never formally asked the patients for their consent to take or use photos as they were taken in a casual and friendly setting. It's never discussed what she would do with these photos. Most of the population that uses the clinic has very limited access to the internet, so they do not use email or social networking sites. When she returns to the United States, she posts some of the pictures from the clinic in an album on Facebook and uses them to encourage other students to become involved in similar volunteer projects. 
None of the patient's names are used, and they are unlikely to ever know that these images have been shared. So, so, so this is not an uncommon uh, occurrence with, with students or trainees that go abroad and then posting their, their pictures on Facebook. Um, do you think, for the panel, do you think then that uh, it was appropriate for the student to use these photos in this manner? Um, so I can say I think it's really important, um, just like you would do here, if there's something really interesting clinically that you want to take a picture of or take some documentation, you still definitely need to ask. And um, when I was in Liberia, there was a lot of stuff that I had never seen before. You know, I saw someone with, with tetanus and I wanted to get a video of it. Um, and we would always ask, and we would always actually have someone there, you know, a native Liberian who could also help with the communication because you don't want to ever have to feel like you have some type of power over this person or feel like, you know, they are, um, they feel like they have to say yes, otherwise you're not going to care for them or, or, you know, just be cognizant of the implications of asking for these types of things. And then honestly, no, I don't think it's appropriate. Just because if you have patients here, why would you post this on Facebook? It's a HIPAA violation. And that's not just a legal thing, that's for our patients, um, you know, their own privacy. And it's really tempting. There's really interesting stuff. There's stuff that you want to share. But I think, you know, you have to be, again, cognizant of the fact that there are certain rules that apply, I think, no matter where you go about human decency and, and respect for other people. And I think, you know, that those should still apply even after you return from someplace or you go someplace. Um, outside of guys, you know, we, a lot of you may or may not know, we ran a field hospital in Haiti for five months, and we had a lot of media come through. We had a lot of volunteer groups that we didn't know come through and want to participate or just see what we were doing. And the amount of people that came through and took pictures of people until we caught, we asked them to stop doing so was unbelievable. You people, you have to think about the context of what was going on. You people that have lost everything, that are injured, you need to respect, they're very, very vulnerable. And so you need to respect people's dignity, number one. And so you, that is the number one foremost thing is to respect patients' dignity, especially people who have been through a very, very vulnerable time. I mean, anywhere you work, you need to do this. And so if you ask someone, like Aaron said, you need to ask someone's permission, in my opinion, ask someone's permission for their picture. Um, and make sure, again, that it's, that, you, that it's explained in a way that people understand exactly what you mean. Um, and Personally, my opinion is that those photos should only be used for educational purposes um, once the permission has been asked, or for, I mean, for your own personal experience. Posting them on the internet, um, uh, social networking sites, to me, is a little bit crossing the line. It's my personal opinion. So, so the, let me ask the question as far as the situation goes. Is, is it not enough, then, that the individuals posed for the pictures or, or sort of implicitly gave their consent to be photographed and therefore that's enough consent? Can I, so regarding that, you, you'll find that you oftentimes have, when you're working in, in, a, in a setting, children especially will like to have their picture taken because it's fun and then they can look at themselves on digital cameras and it's fun and you know, I mean, it's fun, it's a game. But, I mean, these are children. You can't, I mean, you would never, you can't take pictures of children without Consent, and so especially we have. I mean, we would force media and other people to go find the parent before they would take a picture of any child, um, because that you have to, to, to really think about what you're doing. Um, and even if I think if it's somebody, if it's a if it's a friend of yours, and they're you know they're like in social settings, and and you know them well, and they say you know yeah, I, I don't mind you doing this, and you know, it's a not a vulnerable situation, and they're a friend, and you happen to be in wherever South Africa. That um, I mean, then and they're your Facebook friend, and then you can probably put the picture up. It's in a social setting, but if it's a medical setting, and that's only with permission. If it's a medical setting, I would I still don't think it's appropriate. What What about? Oh, Jeremy, yeah, I just I just want the the setting part. I think is crucial, and really the private the public space. So you know, clinical medical settings, um, I think, are very different from sort of like field-based settings or settings where there's kind of public health activities going on that are kind of more uh, population-based. Um, still, in those settings, there needs to be respect and that sort of thing, but, um, you know, public space is also free space, so there's ability you can watch whoever you want in the public space or take photos and that sort of thing. 
just to build on that, um, it's a role responsibility issue as well, right? So if you're a journalist and you're there with your cameras, that's different than you're a doctor and you're taking care of this patient and you're taking the patient's picture. It, it's, a, it's a breaching of that professional relationship. The journalist has a completely different relationship with the people that they're interacting with. Well, then what about the issue of intent? So as in this case, they were used to sort of promote volunteers or say somebody's taking a photo for the use of, of promoting the clinic that they work for, the organization that they work for. Does that alter the appropriateness of, of taking the photos or using the photos? I like your solution. I think you still need permission. Yeah, tell them what you're going to do with it. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Do I have pictures from Beauty that I use to promote a, a master's course that University of Chicago runs two weeks ago in a forum downtown? Yes. But did I have did I have permission from every single person in those photos? Absolutely. Um, and you know, and they knew that it's, it was you know they knew that I was from University of Chicago. They knew that we'd be using those pictures for educational purposes. And and because we saw a lot of things there that we don't see. Here and it's important when you're educating students and you're educating other faculty and members of a university setting where you're promoting education to do to do your best to educate. But you need to make sure that the people or the cases that you're using for education understand that, understand it in their own language, and agree to it. So, so when, when it comes to gaining consent for something like that, how do you get across then the, the <clears throat> educational or the technology and the language barrier? So, so for take a population that doesn't know what Facebook is doesn't have regular access to the internet, how do you gain consent to say that I'm going to be using these photos on the internet if they don't quite know what, what that means? Do you want me to answer that? Anybody, anybody on the phone? You'd be amazed when people actually have Facebook. <laughs> um, but, um, it's, uh, yeah, but I mean, I don't, if I look at my pictures that are on, like you, look, you go to my page and look at pictures that are on Facebook about media, they're, very, they're pictures of tents and things like that. They're not of individual patients. Um, and the way that we did it in Haiti and the way we do it in Liberia is you, you make sure you have an interpreter that speaks fluently both languages and they can explain that um, you're going to be taking pictures for medical education purposes. And those, again, still I don't think those belong on social networking sites. I think that those belong in a professional forum where you're actually teaching something. Like, John was saying pictures of, you know, like a faraway picture of sort of a social event. I mean, I think that's a little bit different. You know, I think it uh, boils down to uh, professionalism uh, because uh, with respect to your direct question, most people, um, you know, understand if you get somebody who can explain that, you know, I'm going to take your photograph, we may use this to get uh, support uh, when we get back home. Most people will understand that. But I don't know how many of you read the New York Times, but uh, last week there were surgical residents who were actually posting you know, examples of interesting cases that they've seen on, on Facebook um, here. Uh, so uh, it, it seems as if uh, we have to double our efforts to make sure that people truly, truly understand what uh, being a doctor means uh, to emphasize what professionalism is because it's not everything that you can write on a sheet of paper don't do this don't do this there are some things that comes uh, with uh, uh, being a care provider that you need to protect the interest of your of the people who are vulnerable who are under your care and uh, if you think that uh, Posting them on the internet or, or Facebook is appropriate if you would want people to post your own picture, your relative's pictures, then you should do it. Uh, but I think it, calls, it boils down to professionalism and if you get the consent used in that setting, I think that to promote you know, support for people like that, most people will understand that that is really um, um, altruistic and, and genuine instead of you know, when you put it in Facebook, it depends on how you, you know, you talk about it. So, there, there was recently an article that actually actually looked at, at the, the use of <coughs> photographs and posting them on social network sites, and, and and they looked at who was posting them, and how the vast majority of them were in global health settings. And so this, this comes up very often that people want to sort of promote what they did or, or make themselves look good on Facebook and make them look like they're do-gooders. Um, so this is a, a, a very serious issue and something that you certainly have, have, have to think about. Um, the, as far as, as 
this goes, we again talked about standards of, of confidentiality. Um, again, do, do you think that they apply with our standards of, of confidentiality, and you mentioned HIPAA, do they apply in those settings again? Yeah, I mean, I think patient privacy is, um, you know, it's important no matter where you go because there are a lot of cultural things that you may not understand. There's, um, you know, there's stigmas with certain diseases still that you don't understand. And I think a good approach in that situation when you're not quite certain of the cultural rules and what people think and what kind of um, sort of cultural ideas that a certain disease might bring about with it, I think it, you're, you're, it's best just to be respectful and try to keep that type of information as personal and private as you can. Um, I mean, I can think of specific situations where we, we would diagnose someone with HIV and they would say, don't tell the family because they will leave that person and they, will, um, they won't take care of them no matter what. It's just automatically, it doesn't matter, that's a bad, you know, that's it. And um, so, I mean, and that raises different ethical questions as well, but it's something that you need to understand that no matter what, you can try to maintain that privacy because there are certain things that you, that are just outside your scope in that limited time that you may have in an area. I I mean to to actually say so you know when I was in the United Arab Emirates I had medical students that I, we were talking and um, you would think that there would be no problem with medical students wanting to take a photograph with a visiting professor. Well, they didn't want their faces with shown anywhere outside of the room. And so, as people were trying to take pictures, and I thought I would take pictures, I would have done so much damage to those medical students if anyone had seen their faces, right? So you can imagine if I was there and I took their picture and then I went and put it up on the internet, right? They would never find husbands or things like that. And it wasn't until I saw that they were saying, no, 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 doctor, no. And I was like, why? Come, let's take pictures. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 we can't take pictures with you. Because they know that I might just take those pictures and go and show them to other people. And then before you know it, somebody has seen their face. And if somebody else has seen your face other than your husband, no one wants to marry you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So, so to play devil's advocate a little bit, what if I made the argument it's like, in most of these situations, no harm is going to be done by posting some of these, these photos on Facebook um, or, or wherever you may post them. What, what if I made that argument? Well, but no, what, no good is, what good is it doing? I mean, it just depends on why you want to post it. What good is it doing? It makes me feel good. And I'm not saying that I post them, but I just, <laughs> that, that, that people have different reasons for posting them. And, and, and if, if one can argue, it's like, well, no harm is done, so what does it matter whether I got consent for it or, or not? I, I think uh, some of this comes down to what, what, what Dr. Wilpati was saying in terms of just professionalism, and, and that we should all practice professionally, and no matter what realm we are, and particularly when it comes to posting stuff like this. I think the, um, talks, the argument that no harm is done is something that kind of goes back to what she was saying about, you know, you don't necessarily know the culture there, and especially when it comes to things like an HIV clinic, you don't know how the, the culture in the area interprets HIV, and, um, especially, I, I know in South Africa, I mean, recently it's not that way anymore, but I know it used to be something that was very stigmatized, you could lose your job, people, I mean, before the transmission was really well understood, people would ostracize uh, people with HIV, and so, you don't know that someone's not going to see the picture of the person in the support group that you would have the caption for, and then they're going to suffer all of these negative consequences. So I think, I mean, I think the idea that no harm is done, well, maybe you think no harm is going to be done because you think you understand it, but you, I mean, who knows how long you were there, you might not totally understand the culture around it. And I think along that note of cultural, cultural context, and this goes to, to your point, Brian, about um, you know, patient confidentiality, you, unless you're born and raised somewhere, you really don't know the cultural context of, of uh, wherever you are. Um, even including different regions of the United States, you really don't know. And so you have to be very careful and always err on the side of caution because you don't want to do something that could actually harm your patient unintentionally. And you think about it, and especially if it comes down to HIV. And, and we had a patient in our hospital community that had HIV, and a couple of our national patient staff found out about it, and they were like, well, you have to move that patient all the way over there to the other. We're like, what are you talking? No, they're like, no, because we're going to catch, we're going to catch HIV. And we're like, you can't, you can't give HIV that way. But you know, it's an education, and and, and 
we educated them and they because they didn't tell any of the patients in the camp because they didn't want to ostracize a patient that was already extremely vulnerable. And the patient happened to be a 14-year-old child that lost their parents. You know, so you have to, and you have to be very careful about when you're working about what you say because you don't want someone to overhear something and misinterpret something that then could potentially harm one of your patients. And in these settings, it can be very difficult to maintain confidentiality confidentiality when there are beds that are about two or three feet apart from each other without any partition. Um, and so again, that's something that you have to be very mindful of and maybe sometimes take patients out of, of that setting or talk to them very discreetly. Okay, so what's on your mind? You're on the panel, you haven't said anything. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just moderators. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, I've, I've definitely seen before uh, pictures that people have taken doing uh, medical missions or whatnot in college. And to be honest, at the time, I didn't really think much of it. I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool that that person's in EOR and they're not even in school. But um, yeah, it never, it never really crossed my mind um, the effects it could have. But I think I really like uh, the point where that if people don't have a concept of what like internet or Facebook is, um, it's, um, I think, no matter what the language, if people don't have a concept of what that is, it's very hard to get it across in a sheet or even through a translator or whatnot. So, uh, personally, I really like the idea of professionalism and intention. I mean, if you want to show your friends you did something really cool, I mean, show them pictures of you, like, I don't know, on a sunset or something. Um, but when it comes to patients themselves, I think that it's part of being professional that you don't, you know, expose them or take advantage of someone who's vulnerable or in a vulnerable situation. Um, so I think if you have good intentions, you would know that it's, it's not, it's not something that might be intuitive, but if you have good intention, it's something that I think comes natural that you don't want to take advantage of people in vulnerable situations. Um, another thing I'll add is that the, definitely the people you don't expect to have Facebook thing is definitely true. I spent, I did anthropology research in, a, in South Africa that really didn't have good internet access, and more than a year after coming back, someone I had worked with there who barely spoke English, friend of me on Facebook. Like they found me and friended me on Facebook. So people people find out that these things happen you don't expect. So we'll move on to the next case then, case three. Um, so case three kind of addresses the issue of reciprocity. Um, a student medical mission group raises ten thousand dollars for a medical mission to Bangladesh through a full year of fundraising. The group ends up spending seven thousand dollars of the funds on student travel another 1500 on student accommodation and transportation once they arrive in Bangladesh. They spend three weeks shadowing without performing any clinical procedures besides administering vaccines in a busy clinic during which time one of the clinic's doctors and one of the nurses spend most of their time supervising the students and acting as translators. The students donate the remaining $1,500 to the clinic for the purpose of purchasing medical supplies subsequently return to the United States. So for, for the panel then, so do you think this is an appropriate use of the resources that were fundraised? I actually feel comfortable commenting on this one. Um, so I actually felt very strongly about this when we planned uh, the Romney trip last year. And we were discussing, because um, you know, they, they always use oh, some of the money we raised to defray the cost of airfare. And it was kind of a discussion of how much we were going to use. And I, especially because you spend the time telling people we're raising this money for this women's clinic in Peru and cervical cancer is such a problem there and you know, that's how you're getting the money. I felt very strongly that as much of our money as possible was gonna go to that clinic in Peru. So we, we paid for all of our accommodation while we were there. We did defray some of the cost of the flights, but the students still paid for a good amount of their flights and so, um, we were able to give um, a, a good amount of money to the clinic um, out of what we raised. And I think it, 
then this again comes back to like keeping in mind what your purpose is when you're going there. So the, the idea of professionalism and that we talked about earlier with um, you know you're going there to try to to help um, to help a medical situation become better, and you, it's really good to to keep that in mind. You know you're not going there to to take a vacation. You're not going there to for them to do something for you. You're going there because you want to help improve the state of things. And I think that that's really what you have to keep in mind when you're allocating your resources. So, <laughs> so this is, this is, I think the people who do Grand Media every year have this same, yeah. We had arguments about it. <laughs> right, so we thought about this too the year before. And um, I think part of it actually is important to think about why you're going, but I would say something in a slightly different way. If the reason you're raising money is to like promote the most short-term good, then it probably is the right choice to just give all your money to somebody who's already working there. The way I, we sort of thought about it is that you are in allowing students to go and see what that that resource, what those resources are, what the setting is, it's almost more of a long-term investment. What you're helping is you're hoping that you will develop doctors who are more aware of what other resource settings are like, that will be invested in this, that will choose careers in the future, that will be that will help, that might be more applicable in those settings. And so I thought that's a lot of what sort of made sense to us in terms of, yeah, it's more of a long-term investment in doctors as well. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I think that that's how you can um, justify the use. I mean, because I said we did use some of the money to pay for um, part, I think I would say probably half of our, of our flights. Um, but I mean, I think it comes down to the fact that, you know, you're going down there to help people who, I mean, have trouble providing for their families or paying their rent. And you know what, like the difference for them having that money is a huge difference. Whereas for us, like what I mean, honestly, what's an extra thousand dollars a month these days? You know, like we're gonna have a good job someday, we're gonna be able to pay it off, you know. I mean it just I, I feel like it does so much more good down there and I feel like you raised it on the premise that it's gonna go to the clinic. And so I I, I don't know, I felt so good about using as much as possible. So you know, I think that's really the whole point of, you know, so what's remedy about? You know, what is it that you want to do? So if you've gathered you know, a lot of equipment, and a lot of people actually want to travel, that's really the reason why they want to do this. And then, by the way, let's get equipment and go and ship it there. And, you, and in fact, the, the word out there is that so many African hospitals are littered with the do-good equipment that people just bring <laughs> on their way to a safari. I mean, that's the worst allocation of resources <laughs> ever, right? So if Remedy is about, you know, we are medical students and we want to go and learn about other systems and please fund us so that we can go there, that's fine. Then, you know, truth in advertising, get the money, raise it, and spend it on all of you going there and learning about what it is. But if it's like, we're going to get all this equipment and we're going to go to serve people there, then the question is how much service are you going to provide and at the end of the time when you leave. So, you know, when we were talking to, uh, you know, when you're thinking about global health, you have to ask yourself, is it what they can do for you or what you can do for them? And, you know, where's the balance in terms of the reciprocity? And, you know, is, are you taking advantage of a vulnerable situations, is it more for your benefit or their benefit? And I think as long as you resolve that ethical dilemma in your mind, then you should raise funds for whatever it is that you want to do and see. But you cannot really do, you know, false advertising and take people's money and use, you know, eighty percent to support yourself and then just, you know, twenty percent. So, you know, those are you know, what's the core value of remedy? in terms of what it is that you want to do and how do you want to sustain it. So, so in, the, in these situations, then, is there an obligation for reciprocity? And, and, and if so, what is, what is considered appropriate reciprocity? Is it money? Is it medical supplies? Is it sort of human resources and applying services? Yeah, I think if there is an obligation for reciprocity because, I mean, as Dr. Olapati said earlier, you are going down there, you are utilizing resources, um, teaching resources, and, you know, whether that must possibly be, as Colin said, you know, you have doctors who are aware of the problems that are out there and working to fix them down the line, or whether it be, 
um, that you are raising money so that, uh, so for instance, our money went to set up um, kind of a mobile clinic so that the clinic that we were at could expand to um, a greater area and serve more women. But I mean, I, I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive either. You know, I think that you, you get, as she said, like the balance, you know, of, of um, you are helping them, but you're also benefiting so much from learning from them and um, the experience of, of feeling that, like you really are maybe doing some good, so. You know, one thing that may be very, very surprising to people who haven't traveled uh, to resource-limited settings is when you get there, you'll be amazed at how happy these people are with the little resources that they have and how generous uh, they usually are in terms of wanting to share whatever limited resources they have. Uh, so again, he, he calls on our uh, you know, sensitivity. I'm sure that I know how rules about it's the intent. You know, just going there and doing good and helping people. I don't think you can put a price on you know, the time that people uh, spend to volunteer to show that you care about people. Uh, showing that you care is not always you know, by giving them money or material things. Just being there to make them feel as if they're human beings, especially in places where you know, people with HIV, nobody wants to talk to them. People who are in the lower caste system, they don't see regular people. So, um, you know, I think one should, uh, it's the intent, you know, that, that's probably the most uh, important instead of the monetary value. I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Olapade, I mean, but I think if, you know, if you're going to, if you want to take something and leave something behind, be it money or supplies, I think it's really important to find out exactly what in advance, exactly what that clinic or that site or whatever, what they really need and do your best to focus your like your supplies and things that you're going to bring them on what they actually need. Um, Aaron and I were just joking that you know JFK Hospital where I work in Liberia they have an MRI machine. They, what are they, they have no idea. No one knows how to even plug it in. I mean it doesn't. You have a generator that doesn't always work. An MRI is actually useless for that hospital at this time of their development. So the other things that will be much more. Realistic and much, much better utilized. So most of the stuff that we try to do when we try to do projects is we want to do something sustainable, so it's lasting. And I understand you know, remedy is necessarily the most sustainable thing, just the way that it's built. But if you got, I mean, that's another thing. But 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 either way, it's still an important thing to do. And I agree with what Colleen says is that there's definitely something in investing, especially in junior people in the medical field, in opening their eyes to something that may actually be something they want to continue with for the rest of their careers. And, and allowing them as a junior point to, to recognize this and then move forward and then they could potentially be leaders in, in the field of global health someday. So there is an importance in investment um, in, in exposure. I mean, especially for, sorry, go ahead. Especially for like people of the first year, second year, third year level, like the most important resource you can bring is often, I mean, the most lasting thing is teaching or expertise, right? That's what they really need. They don't need even $10,000 of antibiotics runs out. Even an MRI machine that nobody can use is permanent but not that useful, but you really want to do is be able to teach somebody to do it and then make that sustainable. But if you're in your first year of medical school, that's not really an option that's available to you. There is sort of like patient education type of things, but sort of recognizing that and then saying, okay, well, the, you know, the ideal is not available to us. What's our next best option? It's right. an important and process. Yeah. And I didn't mean to say there's anything wrong. Right. No, no, no. no. About the wrong just, way. I don't know. I didn't mean to say it's very sort of what we went through, trying to right. figure out, you know, what can we bring, what, what would we like to bring, what can we actually bring, what are we doing here? Right. So, so who should be responsible then for the reciprocity? If we're saying it's sort of an obligation, should it be the students that are going abroad? Should it be the institution that's sending the students abroad? Or should it be the host institution as well? So who should be responsible for making sure that the reciprocity is the appropriate reciprocity? Now, I, I'm not directing that just to you, but just to the just <laughs>
you know, how do I think about this? And I don't think that's something you can absolutely enforce, but it's something you can encourage and hopefully people will take it upon themselves. And now we'll, we'll open it up to a question. We'll skip case number number four um, and open it up to, to questions. Does anybody have general questions about going abroad, about ethics of going abroad? Anything that, that was brought up in, in these cases that you want to explore a little bit more? <clears throat> this is uh, most closely related to the second case. Um, you guys talked a little bit about how, depending on what kind of community you find yourself in, their ideas related to, say, HIPAA-like uh, societal rules um, might be different than the way people practice in the U.S. typically. And what do you think is the most effective way when you arrive at a new community and you're, say, wanting to talk to a patient and interview them about their medical history and personal information? What's the, and say that, you know, their family's there, or say even it's a community clinic where it's considered a really positive thing that everyone kind of knows each other's business because they all live in like a 10 person village and it's really you know supportive of each other and trying to make sure everyone gets their health care. How what do you think is the best way to approach a situation like that in terms of making sure the patient gets a privacy at a standard you're comfortable with based on your training, but also being sensitive to the community's values? So I'll, I'll, this would be this is my thought. Before you go anywhere outside of coming to the University of Chicago to, to learn medicine or practice medicine, do do due diligence to learn as much as you possibly can about the place you're going, the, historic, the, the history of the country, the history of the area, the, the region of the country you're going, as much as you can about the culture, talk to people who have been there, get, gather as much information as you possibly can to prepare yourself before you go. Once you get there, number one, be humble, understand that you're a visitor, listen, don't just, I mean, you, the last thing you want to do is run in there and just try to like, be like I'm here, I'm, like, you know, I'm here at the University of Chicago and I'm gonna take over, I mean, that's not gonna work. So you need to just, so just to be humble and listen and really like, try to talk to people. You're gonna get so much information by, by, by talking to people, learning what's appropriate and what's not. And you don't necessarily have to jump right into anything. So take, take some time and try to sort out exactly how things, how things go. And if you don't have, I mean, if you don't have the luxury of a lot of time to kind of figure it out, and there'll be experiences where you're not going to know, go with your gut. Go with your gut and what you think is the right thing to do. You're not going to be wrong most of the time. You know, you, you know. And I think if you say, "Hey, I want to talk to you privately," and people are like, "No, no, 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 it's fine," and the patient's like, "It's fine," and all the nurses say, "No, no, that's fine," and you get that global reassurance, then you know, go with what you think is the right thing to do. All you can do is do the best you can. I, I'm certainly a believer in. The individual student having a lot of responsibility um, and, and when we choose students to go abroad and we prep students to go abroad one of the things is that they should take the responsibility to do their due diligence before they leave and do research about the healthcare system of it, about the situation that they're going into um, as, as you know that i sent you articles on chile the chilean healthcare system before going and anytime i go somewhere i, I, I do a search on, on that country try to learn more a little bit about the healthcare system, about some of the major issues that they may be, may be going through. And then I'll, I'll read up about their issues just in a moment class to so get understand what the religion is, what's the sort of democratic makeup. But I think it, it, it falls upon you as, as trainees that when you go abroad, that you do your due diligence to learn about the place that you're going. So you don't show up as, as just sort of a dumb American tourist, uh, that, that, you, that you take responsibility for the place that you're going. And, and you are humble. And you're sort of learned, at least somewhat learned, about what the situation is that you're going into. Just, I just want to point out the, the tension, because uh, I don't know if it's obvious to everyone, between um, doing your due diligence and feeling like you really understand the, the place you're going and being humble. Because it's really easy to do your due diligence and think, now I understand you. And there's a great New Yorker cartoon with a, with a guy talking, a white man talking to an African American at a party saying, I've seen most of Spike Lee's movies, so I, I know pretty much what it's like. <laughs> and, the, and this comes up in cultural competence training all the time. And, and I, I would almost, I, I liked exactly your message, but I would put it the other way around. Right. Be humble, <laughs> be curious, and do what you can to, to understand where the people that are coming from, recognizing, by the way, that they're individuals. And, you know, in Indonesia once, uh, I had, uh, after the tsunami, I had someone talk to me about stakeholder theory. 
and organizational development and what was happening in the Indian. This was, you know, patient um, in Banda Achin. So I was not expecting that. And had I thought, you know, I know exactly what people here are like, uh, you know, I don't think I would have been prepared to, to, to enter into that discussion, which was a great discussion. But she sounded like you know, she was a consultant for the healthcare system in the US. Yeah, the other thing that I would advise you guys to do, which I see a lot, and I think I probably did it when I first started this too, is try to avoid the us and them. So wherever you are, well, we, well, in the United States, we do this, and here, wherever I am, you do this, and we, in America, like, try to, it's, it, try to avoid that. That's your reference point. That's what you know, right? But at the same time, it, like, that just causes, that there is no us and them. I mean, it's, it's everybody together, and so you need to, you, it's your responsibility to learn how things are done where you are, and to adapt to that. It's not the, the patients or the families or the practitioners responsibility wherever you're working to adapt to what, to adapt to you. So it's the other way. You gotta, you just shouldn't try to seamlessly segue in to where you are. I, I think, and getting back to sort of when we were talking about standard of care, one, one word that I, I really like in these sort of settings is just contextualize. Um, contextualize everything. Contextualize with, with the culture, contextualize with the individual patient. I, I've read some recent articles about the idea of, of cultural competency really sort of being stereotyping and somewhat racist. That, that, that what we don't need is, is necessarily cultural competence. We just need to learn how to approach an individual patient and contextualize their, not just their life, but contextualize them as an individual within a healthcare system, within a political system, within an economic system, as a way to approach every patient in every, every situation. Because um, you can apply that contextualization then to the standard of care based on the resources you have available, uh, apply it to confidentiality, um, and, and, and so on. So, when I approach those situations, I really just try to contextualize everything as, as much as, as, as possible, if that makes sense. And so with that, I guess we'll, we'll go to the, the last couple of slides we have are sort of things that, that you can do as trainees and then things that, that we can do as sort of an institution. Okay. I, I just put these together, um, but we've talked about a lot of them. But Balancing, seeking out new experiences for yourself and skills, but knowing your own limitations at the same time. And to clearly define your goals and expectations for the project, both with mentors here in Chicago and with your mentors abroad before you begin your project so you know exactly what your family is getting out of it. Um, demonstrate and work towards cultural competency and perhaps adaptability. Um, and take appropriate measures to ensure your own personal safety. Don't So now, what can we do for you? And by, by we, I sort of mean royal we and us as, as advisors, as mentors, as faculty, Prince Square as an institution, the Global Health Initiative, and, and the University of Chicago, and, and, and some things that we can do is, is develop well-structured programs. So one thing that, that we're, we're working hard on in the Global Health Initiative is, is creating programs that are structured uh, in, in the sense that, that we establish and maintain Really beneficial part partnerships with other institutions. Um, and this also gets back to reciprocity as well. That we, we've created partnerships that allow us to send students but also receive students and also to create lasting beneficial partnerships in, in the sense that what we're providing is what they need uh, in the sense whether it's education or whether, whether it's research. And so that's something that we're doing. Um, we can clear, help you clearly define responsibilities, goals, and expectations. Again, this comes down to um, making sure of knowing what you're getting into uh, so you're not surprised. Uh, we can match students with experiences appropriate for their skill level and interest. So we want to make sure that, that if you're preclinical, so if you're a first or second year student, that you're going into a situation or an experience that is appropriate for your skill level and you're not going to be asked to be performing surgery or doing sutures. But then if you're a fourth year student and you now have clinical years behind you, we find the appropriate setting for you where now you can do some clinical experience. Again, hopefully catered to um, your skill level, but that's certainly something that we can do. Um, we can establish effective supervision and mentorship, both locally and abroad. Again, I think that gets back to some accountability issues. Um, we want to send you places where you're appropriately supervised, uh, and appropriately supervised in a way that you're not taking away human resources from uh, the local community. Um, and that may be also applying supervision by sending by going abroad. Like I went abroad with Remedy, and, and, and my wife is an OB guy, and she went as well. And, and we provided not only supervision, but we did education as, as well to, for, for the students. Um, 
So we can also develop formal and informal educational opportunities like what we're doing now. So we can educate you about ethics and professionalism when you go abroad. Um, so you can learn cultural competency, uh, think about language, and then also personal safety. And then the last thing is, if, is we can establish mechanisms for feedback and evaluation. So these structured programs that we are working on building, we want to know, was it appropriate? Were you doing appropriate things? Was the supervision appropriate? Were sort of the people that you were accountable to, were you accountable to them? Were they accountable to you? Um, so these are all things that, that we can help. Um, and what I want to stress is that when, if you're thinking of going abroad or you want to go abroad, come and talk to us. Um, I mean, through the Global Health Initiative, we do have these structured programs that we're putting together. So we can send you to, to a uh, send you to uh, have an experience that, that fits your skill level and fits what you want to do. Um, I just have some references like articles about this. If any of you are interested, I'm happy to just email them to you because I know you can have a reference on the screen. It doesn't necessarily help you that much. But just let me know. I'm happy to send them to you guys. And thanks for coming. So are there any, any other questions?